We are your home of America's sleeping team. Of course, <laughs> we all knew that this would happen. Literally the only organization, the only one in the NFL who did not make a free agent transaction or any transaction yesterday and said we have an extortion case to talk about. And I first saw this from Mike Florio, Pro Football Talk. Dot com, who joins us on the DNM leasing hotline? Of course, the book is out. Father of mine, only three ninety nine for the ebook option. Mike, good morning. How crazy was yesterday for you? Well, it was very crazy. It's one of our most uh, jam packed days of the year. I think we had one hundred and thirty seven total posts at ProFootballTalk dot com over the course of the full twenty four hour period. You know, it's the and it drives people crazy. Some people in the media when You call it the legal tampering period because it's not really tampering if it's permitted and it's the negotiating window. Look, tampering is rampant in the NFL, and when these deals get done 15 minutes after the green flag gets waved, it tells you that there were communications, extensive communications and negotiations before noon Eastern, 11 Central yesterday. So a lot of stuff happened, but but of all the stories, of all the moves, of all the releases, transactions, and trades, our most traffic story of the entire day, even though we didn't post it until about 7 o'clock Eastern yesterday, was this Dak Prescott extortion case. That was number one of free agency? Number one. Number one on wow. the first day of free agency was the Prescott case. Mike, uh, kind of reset the story for us, if you could, please. Well, and I got the email yesterday from Levi McCathern's office. You've heard his name in connection to clients like Michael Irvin and Jerry Jones in some ongoing litigation specifically involving Jones. And the the allegation generally is that there was an extortion plot against Dak Prescott. Now, when you read the lawsuit and the attachment to it, it started as what is very common in the legal profession. Before you sue someone, before you bring that case, it is customary but not universal to reach out to the person with what they call a demand letter. It's all in writing. Here it is. Here are the claims I'm going to make. Here is what we want in order to not go forward. If I recall correctly, and I think I do, the Deshaun Watson situation from three years ago started the same way, with a demand letter. And there were negotiations that went nowhere, and then a lawsuit gets filed, and the rest is history. So in this case, Dak Prescott received a letter dated January 16, accusing him of a sexual assault in February of 2017, laying out some of the basic facts and then ultimately saying that barring a settlement, she'll go to the cops and file suit and they want a hundred million dollars. Now, when I saw a hundred million dollars, I thought this is above and beyond what anyone would ever reasonably expect Mm. as even though it's negotiable, that is a ridiculously high opener. And maybe that set off some red flags and maybe caused uh, a greater degree of zeal an effort to try to be able to prove that this was all fabricated. But that's the argument. The tables have been turned. They've taken this demand letter and they've filed an actual lawsuit against the accuser and her lawyers saying it's fabricated, it's phony, it's false, and it's an effort to extort him with this threat that they're going to make him look bad and make this allegation public and paint him in a way that the facts don't justify. Does the fact that this allegation happened in 2017 mean anything like oh why did it take so long for it to come out right now or a judge would not care about that well there have been various statutes that have come out in the aftermath of the me too movement very useful and helpful and positive ways to preserve the ability of individuals to file lawsuits years after the fact the typical reaction and your instincts are right Because for most cases, and I haven't researched the laws in Texas on this point, which is a fancy way of saying I don't know, (laughs) but the statute of limitations and there may be other wrinkles that have been introduced that make it easier for people who need time to come to terms with what's happened. You know, two years, which is the standard personal injury statute of limitations, that might not be enough for somebody who's been the victim of sexual assault to process everything that they've gone through, to muster the courage necessary to step into the arena and go against his or her accuser. So I don't know whether or not the statute of limitations was squandered here and missed here by not bringing this up sooner. That would be a pretty potent defense 
to any claim that gets made. And it will also show if the lawyers are in a position in Texas to know that this thing is not going to fly because it was being pursued too late, that makes it feel even more meritless and more like an effort to just shake Dak Prescott down, as he alleges, for a big payday in order of having this lawsuit get filed. Mike Florio, ProFootballTalk.com, joining us here, 105 to the fan. How do these generally end? Do they end in a, like, is it a settlement? Do they end more on the, usually on the side of the complainant? I mean, how does this usually end? Well, it's all driven by the facts and the law. And, look, most cases get settled. I doubt there's going to be a trial in open court with Dak Prescott going against these individuals and proving his case. But based upon his first move, and it is rare, I've seen, like with Dalvin Cook, he was sued for a domestic violence situation, and he ultimately sued the accuser and her lawyer for similar types of claims, saying it was all made up, it was all fabricated, it was all falsified. And, hey, when the NFL beefed up the personal conduct policy after the Ray Rice situation in 2014, it created a potential incentive and temptation for people to make these kinds of claims, to try to get someone to write a check and settle cases before it gets to this point. Because once this gets out there and the NFL starts poking around, you can have careers derailed. So, I, and I've heard stories about, you know, guys just kind of, you know, writing a check to make something go away, even if they thought it was fake, they just didn't want the headache. But in this case, yeah, it depends on how determined and motivated Dak Prescott is. Chances are it gets resolved at some point once he decides he's, he's, you know, he's made his point, he's proved it, he's had enough, and he's moving on. But based upon this kind of aggressive, unprecedented, out of the gates, I'm suing you before you can even sue me, that speaks to a level of determination that isn't going to go away anytime soon, and maybe he will see this through all the way to the end. Mike, when when it's sent around to you know you know from Levi McCatherine's office and it talks about an extortion plot, what is what would be the the legal I guess definition between just like the notification and the listing of the terms and extortion? Like, is this legally extortion? Well, extortion gets used recklessly all the time. When the Broncos went to Russell Wilson and said, "We're going to bench you." if you don't adjust your contract language regarding the vesting of guarantees, people were calling it extortion. Well, that, no, that's not extortion. I mean, in the classic sense, extortion, blackmail, it's going to somebody saying, hey, look, if you don't give me this money, I'm going to do this thing. And, and I'm otherwise not going to do this thing unless you give me money. But I will do it if you don't give me the money. That, that is blackmail. That is extortion. But in the legal setting, it is a permissible way to attempt to resolve claims. And there's value, there's settlement value in having these conversations before you file the lawsuit. And I'd say plenty of people who are in a high profile would have preferred to have a chance to resolve the case before it ever gets filed because there is value in having it never come to light. And that's, there's a line there somewhere between legitimate pre-litigation demands made on behalf of a client and extortion. And it all comes down to whether or not there are any facts to back this up. That's why it's important for any lawyer. And I've practiced law for a long time. You have somebody come into your office and they tell you a story. You don't just accept that at face value. You don't just say, well, you know what? If you're willing to testify under oath that it happened, that's good enough for me. You need to be sure. You need to do a reasonable investigation. You need to see what the evidence is to back up the claim before you just run forward with an effort to squeeze a little money out of somebody. I mean, that, that's what the argument would be here. They asked for $100 million, just they were hoping for anything from Dak Prescott. Mm. And whether or not it actually happened became either overlooked or immaterial to the effort to try to try to get him to write a check. Mike Florio, ProFootballTalk.com, talking about the Dak Prescott sexual assault story here on Sean and RJ. NFL, get involved with this? At this point, probably not. However, she'll have the right to make a counterclaim. I mean, this is the ultimate calling of your bluff because when anyone files a lawsuit, the person who's sued as part of their response can make a claim back against the person who has sued them. And there are mandatory counterclaims and permissive counterclaims. And in this case, I don't know that she would have to do it, but she can do it, the table's set. And if she makes that claim, 
if she reduces it to writing, if her lawyers put their name on it, that may be the kind of thing that requires the NFL to commence an investigation into it. And, you know, based upon the fact that Dak Prescott went out there and filed the suit exposing all this on his own, that would tell me he's comfortable with it. Go ahead. Let's investigate it. I'll cooperate with you fully. I don't know who this person is. This never happened. This is fabricated. Then I'm just paraphrasing what he would be saying logically based upon this initial tactic he's he's deployed. He would probably welcome the NFL looking into it because he's insisting to anyone who will listen that he didn't do this. Mike, last thing on this. Did any part of Dak's counter talk about having like a consensual relationship or contact with this person or you're taking it as he doesn't even know who she is i i have to go back and look at it more carefully again i took the reaction as this is all completely entirely made up but it's a great question and i'll circle back around to it and take a closer look at the factual allegations because obviously yesterday was not the day yeah. <laughs> to deviate for an hour or two from the flow of the news yeah. and get into all the nooks and crannies of it but the, the lawsuit itself is only 11 pages long. There aren't a lot of facts in it. They attached the letter that was sent. I'll take another look at it, and uh, that's a good follow-up. And, hell, I mean, given the fact that it's Dak Prescott, it's the Cowboys, and, you know, the nature of the, the situation and the kind of unprecedented tactic he's taken, it, it makes it something that, that merits a closer look. The money is coming in for Aaron Jones in Minnesota. One year seven million dollars mike what was what were your biggest day one takeaways of free agency well obviously the fact kirk cousins left the vikings for the falcons by the way congrats you, you you were on that one uh well ahead of everyone else congrats well and and look uh, and here's the thing i mean and i appreciate it people are like oh hey oh the kirk goes to the falcons so that proves you were right well i was right either way because he was looking into schools and homes in Atlanta, that's what we reported. And that was verified. I wouldn't have said it. I wouldn't have written it. I wouldn't have talked about it. I wouldn't have breathed a word of it if I wasn't sure that was happening. If he had stayed in Minnesota, it was still true. And as of yesterday, it's like, you know, is this just kind of a ruse to get the Vikings to cough it up or is something really going on here? And one, one of the things about this that is still kind of confusing to me, how does he pass a physical at this point? What, what do the Falcons know about that Achilles tendon? And how much were they even able to find out before they offered him that money. And how much of this becomes kind of blatant tampering to get that information before you make that offer? But that was the big one, obviously. Running backs getting paid, a lot of running backs moving from team to team. The Cowboys obviously lose Tony Pollard, Derrick Henry still floating around out there. And I heard you at the beginning say the Cowboys are the only team that didn't make any moves. Look, remember, and we've learned this every year, it's full gold from the team's perspective it's always better to wait and let the market soften and then go bargain shopping. If you sign somebody that first day, you're almost always overpaying dollar for dollar for what you could get down the road once the big money flows, once the budgets are exhausted. So this could help the Cowboys. And it's not like they're in a position to go out and freely spend. That Dak Prescott cap number as of tomorrow at 4 o'clock Eastern, 3 o'clock Central is going to be $59.4 million unless they do something about it. Mike, how surprised are you that this DAC deal is not done yet? And what is it telling you of anything? Well, it, you know, look, they, they, they put themselves in this mess when they didn't give him a new contract after his third season, when they franchise tagged him after his fourth season, after his fifth season, one year under the tag, they realized we're in a pickle here. And to get out of it, they put themselves in an even worse situation now where He's entering the last year of his contract. They can't franchise tie him next year. He'll walk away into free agency if they don't extend it. They need to drop that $59.4 million. They've still got like another $35 million, I think. I think it's $90 million total over the next two years. They can play some games this year and do a restructuring and knock it from 59 down to 40, but that just makes it higher next year. It makes it like 53. I think the total number is like $95 million over the next two years in cap charges they will take for Dak Prescott. One way out of that, is to do the extension. So he's got a ton of leverage. He had a great year. He can basically name his price. What the Cowboys have to ask is, are we going to give in and give him $60 million a year, or are we just going to say, we'll do this one more year, we'll deal with the cap consequence, and then they step into the shoes of the Vikings next year, where the quarterback has the ability to go 
wherever he wants to go because, again, there is nothing they can do to block his path to the market in 2025. The mob novel, the ebook, is Father of Mine. Mike Florio is offering it up for all the Tolos. Go ahead and take advantage. ProFootballTalk.com with all of your nonstop NFL coverage. I cannot believe the number one story is Dak Prescott's lawsuit. America's team, baby. Mike, thank you so much. See you guys.